The content of this presentation is a section of an investigation into the form of embodiment that is formed during the experience of a virtual world called Second Life. Throughout history and oftentimes as a result of technological progress, the human body and consequently its embodiment have continually evolved and been redefined. During the presentation, I will utilize data collected during ethnographic research I have undertaken in Second Life over the last year and a half. Drawing on Molo Ponti and Husserl, I apply this data for a phenomenological analysis to unveil the aboutness of the experience of Second Life, or, in philosophical terms, the intentional structure of the experience. From Merle Ponty, I acquire my framework of analysis, whilst Husserl provides me with an approach in the form of a phenomenological description, which I unfortunately cannot include here due to time limitations. So, what is happening when one is in Second Life? We have two possible answers, each one from a different perspective, that of the observer and that of a Second Life user. As a researcher, I have tried to position myself within and understand both stances, and it is through the disparity between these two answers that the complete answer comes forth and reveals the intentional structure of Second Life. On the one hand, an observer will note that the user's body is located within the physical world. At a computer, with the eyes glued on the screen and fingers moving across the keyboard, alternating between focusing on the directional arrow keys or utilising all the character keys, which in turn results in the avatar moving or words being written on the computer screen. Yet, for the user, it feels like she or he is actually carrying out the actions in the world of Second Life and as a result, reacts with mild to strong affective responses to what is taking place during the experience. Hence, the user might feel elated or downhearted as a result of something that happened in Second Life. By putting these two answers in dialogue with each other, I hope to demonstrate how the body is altered and consequently its role in shaping experience transformed. In this presentation, I will focus on one aspect, the relation between the user and the avatar. The user's body, as mentioned earlier, is in fact not inactive. The main activity during the experience of Second Life, which, which I will now onwards call in-world experience, is the act of looking or seeing. Hence, it offers a logical starting point to the analysis. Merleau Ponty says that, quote, to see an object is either to have it on the fringe of a visual field or actually be concentrating on it, end quote. In the context of an in-world experience, the room the user is in and the computer are located within the fringe of a visual field, receding away from the user's consciousness. As a result, the graphical world of Second Life emerges as the focus of the act of looking. Simultaneously, on a second level within the Second Life graphics, whereby the avatar is at the lower centre of the screen, the avatar alternates between being on the fringe of the visual field and the focus point on which the user is concentrating. For example, if I am editing the appearance of my avatar, the world of Second Life recedes to the fringe of the visual field as the avatar becomes my focus. However, when I am focusing on the world, the avatar never really fades into the fringe, partly because of the centrality of its location on the screen. So in order to better understand what happens to the avatar, I utilise Merleau Ponty's object horizon structure to assist the analysis. Expanding on the findings pertaining to the structure of looking, Merleau Ponty advances that each object has an inner horizon and the relation between the various horizons is at the core of the act of looking. Adjusting his words to suit our problem, it can be said that the inner horizon of the computer cannot become an object without the surrounding objects in the room becoming a horizon. How does this apply to Second Life? Well, just as Gardamer argues this horizon structure extends over time, past and present, I contend it also extends into Second Life. 
Merleau-Ponty explains that, quote, the object horizon is not an obstacle to me when I want to see the object, for just as it is the means whereby objects are distinguished from each other, it is also the means whereby they are disclosed, end quote. Hence, if we come back to the avatar in second life, we observe that instead of receding into the fringe of a visual field, it acts as the object horizon against which the setting of second life is seen and perceived. In other words, objects or other avatars within second life are apprehended in relation to the avatar. Merleau Ponty further elaborates, quote, I regard my body, which is my point of view upon the world, as one of the objects of the world, end quote. Hence implying the existence of a body horizon from which the world is perceived. How might this body horizon differ from other object horizons? Well, as the body horizon belongs to the body, it is the one and only perspective from which the perception of the world is shaped and reshaped. For example, we can say that during the inward experience, I am sitting at a table on which a computer is located. Although the computer is related to the table, my presence is crucial to it being perceived as such. If I were to turn around on the chair, I would see something completely different. Yet, if the computer were rotated, it would not alter the rest of the world that I perceive. The body horizon is a subjective position from which the world is perceived. And, in second life, the avatar performs this task of creating a subjective position from which the world of second life is perceived. For this reason, I argue that the avatar does not only act as an object horizon, but also integrates itself into the user's body horizon. The implications of this are significant. If we look closely at the in-word experience, we realise that the user's body becomes deficient as it cannot move through and directly sense or feel the world of second life. Yet, we can conceive human experience only as being incarnate. Reacting with an instinct to preserve this being in the world experience, as well as refusing the imposed disablement of a context, the user compensates as best possible. During the in-world experience, the avatar body has the needed motor skills, whilst the user's body has the necessary perceptual, sensual and tactile qualities utilised in an embodied experience. Together, both bodies comprise the phenomenal body. Hence, without making a deliberate choice at a conscious level, the user allows the avatar to act as an ambivalent aspect of the body in a manner similar to Merleau-Ponty's injured soldier who still perceives through his amputated or phantom limb. Through this process of redefining the body, the experience of second life not only becomes more complete, but it also helps to explain the why behind the affective response within the user's body. The difference between the avatar's body and user's body is blurred and hence what happens to the avatar is experienced as happening to the user. Let me illustrate this point by sharing an experience I had in second life. One day, another avatar invited me from my avatar to visit a small theatre he owned in second life. As soon as my avatar arrived there and looked around the place, I discovered that the whole theatre was made out of a texture of bamboo. All of a sudden, I became aware that as I was sitting at my desk, I could smell and even feel bamboo under my hands. The avatar, for its motor skills, was able to move through this space, and my physical body apprehended the sight of it. By conflating my location with my avatar's location, I was able to generate a body memory of bamboo to recreate the experience of, at that moment in time. Hence, I hypothesize that the inward experience consists of two bodies, the users and the avatars, working in symbiosis with each other to produce the lived and bodied quality within the experience. I term this sim-embodiment.